that he may have had handcuffs on his wrists, but he always had Christ on his mind. It was Christ on Paul's mind that gave him a new motivation to rejoice in the Lord. Not to be discouraged in the Lord, but to become more determined to be dedicated to the Christ, no matter how difficult life may become. What allowed Paul to be in prison, but to remain positive? What allowed Paul to be confined but to remain confident. What allowed Paul to be in a bad situation, but still see himself as being blessed? Come on, everybody, put your hands together. It's got to get better. All over the world, listen to these words. People come. People come. People go. People go. Your life has been. Your life has been. Out of control. Out of control. You're confused. You're confused. But don't worry. Don't worry. Your soul can get better. Cause God, God is in control, y'all. Hey, we praise the Lord. I told you we're going to persevere no matter what we're going to get through this. Amen. Amen. We'll pick those songs at the, at the end of the day. But hey, this is what you come for anyway to get the word of God. Amen. Amen. So we're going to get ready to give you what thus says the Lord. You know Pastor Green can't sing, so I'm going to get right into the Word of God. Amen. So if you have your Bible, let's check out your Bible. We're going to be in that great book of Philippians, chapter number 4, verses 12 and 13. That great book of Philippians. See, this is how you have to approach life. You adjust, you adapt, and you overcome. You keep it moving. Amen. So we're going to keep it moving with the Word of God. And in the great book of Philippians, chapter number 4, verse 12. 12 through 13, and it reads, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be in plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. In verse number 13, I can do all things through him who giveth me strength. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. This morning, we're just going to spend a little time in the book of Philippians, in chapter number four, and talk about the secret sauce to your success. The secret sauce to your success. In the first ch chapter of Philippians, it was all about the message of Christ, of being worthy to suffer for Christ. In the second chapter, it was about having the mind of Christ to be humble. In the third chapter, it was about the ministry of Christ, of being willing to stretch forth towards that high calling in Christ Jesus. And here this morning, in chapter number four, it's about the motivation to rejoice in the Lord. Somebody at home say, rejoice in the Lord. Not rebel against the Lord. My brothers and sisters, my first point as it relates to the secret sauce to success is learning how to rejoice anyhow. Okay. Rejoice in spite of. Yeah. Rejoice nevertheless. Rejoice because God is always good. Refocus on rejoicing, my brothers and sisters, not on being rebellious. Here, Paul, throughout the whole book of Philippians, we see this word, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. In chapter number four, he says, rejoice and be a why is he constantly coming back to this word, rejoicing. It means if you are a teacher in the school, whenever your students continuously get failing grades, that's a signal that they have to continuously to repeat the lesson. So here it lets us know that here in the book of Philippians that Paul is repeating this word of rejoicing is because the church is not rejoicing enough and is on the verge of rebellion from what they have been taught. Paul wanted the faithful to know 
who were concerned about his well-being, that he may have had handcuffs on his wrists, but he always had Christ on his mind. It was Christ on Paul's mind that gave him a new motivation to rejoice in the Lord. Not to be discouraged in the Lord, but to become more determined to be dedicated to the Christ, no matter how difficult life may become. What allowed Paul to be in prison, but to remain positive? What allowed Paul to be confined, but to remain confident? What allowed Paul to be in a bad situation, but still see himself as being blessed? Philippians 4 and 11 says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be what? Content in whatever the circumstance. You see, the secret sauce for Paul and the secret sauce for people who are successful is that they are never satisfied with what they know because they know that there's always more to know. You see, successful people in the Apostle Paul have the ability to refocus their attitudes, their actions, and their attention from what's wrong in life to what can I learn from these wrong circumstances. You see, when we are rejoicing and we are reflecting on what's going wrong, but what can I learn from this wrong, it creates a different energy for our life a different expectation from our life, and then ultimately a different experience in our life. Why? All because we are rejoicing over how God is still working in our lives, that God is not disconnected just because we have confusion, chaos in our lives. No, God is not that temporal. He is the eternal God that makes a promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you, my brothers and sisters. That's what gives us the opportunity to rejoice, to know that this is not the end. This is not my final destination. This is not a period in my life. It's just a comma. My brothers and sisters, Paul, he's not complaining about his circumstances. He's not criticizing others because of his circumstances but he's learning from them. You see, successful people have a mindset that is different. What is that mindset? It's not a mindset of being critical, but people who are successful and people who are led by God's spirit. When we encounter wrong things or wrong situations or, or just bad seasons in our life, we use those as an opportunity not to go negative, not to go south, but to be constructive and to be open to what God is speaking into our lives. You see, when things don't necessarily go your way in life, do you become distant? Do you become despondent? Do you come at, develop a deaf ear that you can't hear what God is trying to speak into your life? Or are you open for constructive feedback? that can help you to grow and to learn and to become who God is actively working in your life to become. You see, my brothers and sisters, successful people choose their learnings from bad situations and their leverage to build back better for their future. You see, Paul was a praiser and a rejoicer in the Lord which position him. There's a difference, my brothers and sisters, when you are a praiser and when you are a rejoicer. It repositions you to receive a fresh revelation that ultimately contributes to his ability to be a lifetime learner. He never stops learning because the minute we stop learning is the minute we start dying. You see, when we can refocus our energy from rebelling 
to rejoicing. We can learn like Paul to understand that I might be in pain, but from God's perspective, somehow, some way, there is purpose for my pain. Yes, Lord. You see, Paul, he knew a lot about pain. Paul lived a life of pain. We see in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27, Paul, who five times received from the Jews 40 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. He was uh, always on the move. Always in danger. Always under attack. He labored and he toiled and he went without sleep. He was hungry and he was thirsty and he went without food. He was cold and he was naked. But yet, he wasn't complaining. He was celebrating that God saw his life as been worthy enough to suffer for the name of Jesus. Paul had a different perspective for his pain. He didn't allow his pain to allow him to be polluted with the poison of a negative attitude. You see, through each of these bad experiences, Paul received a revelation where he learned that this that there was purpose in his pain. How is there purpose in his pain? Through these bad experiences, these situations, they revealed the reality of Paul's weakness. Because you see, Paul had a great resume. He had a great teacher. He was a Benjamite. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the law. He kept the law. So Paul had it all. But Paul had to learn that he really, really did not have it all. And so through these experiences, they broke him down so that he could realize you may think you're strong, Paul, but you're really weak. So it's from these experiences that Paul received a revelation where he rejoiced in his weaknesses and his deficiencies in life. So I said, well, why? Would you rejoice in your weaknesses and in your deficiencies in life? You see, Paul had a revelation. He got the big picture for why he was going through in life. His weaknesses, his deficiencies, his pain. He gave the opportunity to open up the door and help Paul to realize it's not about his deficiency, but it's all about God's sufficiency to sustain you and to keep you in your life. You see, if everything continues to be rosy in Paul's life, if he continues to be on the beach and continue to have life to go without no trials and tribulations, Paul would have the mistake of thinking that it was all about him. But sometimes in life, each of us got to be knocked down off our high horse so we can know that we can't make it without God on our side. It was when Paul was weak that he learned that God is strong. We know the story when he had those three thorns in his side that he cried out to God three times, Lord, please take these thorns out of me. He was weak in flesh. He couldn't remove the pain and he cried out. But God didn't deliver. What did God do? God said, what? My grace is sufficient. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. When Paul got this revelation that his weaknesses were revealing the strength and the power and the presence of God, he said, therefore, I will boast all the more glory in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. My brothers and sisters, sometimes in life, we have to experience personally for ourselves to know that God is real. You say, what are you talking about? You see, some of us, we hear people talking about God's grace. We read about God's grace. We even think about God's grace. But that does not let you know that you truly know God's grace. You see, if you just heard about God's grace, if you just read about God's grace, I would surmise to you 
that you might not know God's grace. You're just aware of God's grace. Why do you say that? You see, we do not know God's grace until we personally experience God intervening and interrupting our hopeless situation where we know if it had not been done for God on my side, where would I be? Yeah. How would I know God's grace is sufficient if I'm always sufficient? How would I know that joy comes in the morning if I never cried all night long? Yeah. How would I know that God is all I need if God is the only thing that I had in my life? In circumstances like these, that we serve as God's instructor, where God inspires us and teaches us and indwells us with a hope that a book cannot teach you or teach me. My brothers and sisters, believers, we are not exempt from problems, but we are empowered from the problems to rejoice and to learn and grow more. You see, if you have to go through, make sure you come out with more wisdom, more discernment, more revelation, more discipline, more determination. I have a question for you out there. What are you learning from this pandemic? What do you learn from what you're going through right now? It's time for you and I to shift our mindset from why I need to thank God for teaching and transforming me as I go through this life. I got some good news if you're going through this morning. What you're going through is not your permanent living quarters for your life. What you're going through is only a temporary part of space for this season in your life. I want to speak some fresh light into someone this morning. Be on notice that some of us may be receiving a notification alert in 2021 that there's no more time on the clock of whatever you're going through. It's time to move out of that temporary parking space into your season of breakthrough and breakout. You see, the reason why we're able to rejoice in difficult times is because we're able to reconsider and recalibrate what is really relevant and what is irrelevant in our lives. You see and learn here, my brothers and sisters, that everyone wants to be successful in life. Every race, every gender, every age, every species wants to be successful. But Paul is teaching us what is truly successful. That's the million dollar question. You see, the world's definition of success is based on what you have accomplished. It's based upon what we have accumulated. And see, that is temporary. It's temporary and it's slowly passing away. And it leads sometimes to us rebelling against God. You see, the world's definition of success is deceptive. And it's tragic because it focus on what cannot remain forever and ignores what is eternal. Moses in Hebrews 11 25 says, Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You see, that which attracts us can trap us. Sin deceives us with pleasure as a sign of success. But the key thing is, it can never sustain you. It can only tease you. You see, the world based success on its final product, the final outcome, or whatever the final score is. We remember the New England Patriots. They won the championship, but they lost the celebration because it was revealed that they cheated with spy game. You remember Lance Armstrong? He won seven Tour de France. He won the race, but he went out in disgrace because he had an unfair advantage with enhancement drugs. The church is not exempt. Religious leaders 
achieve fame with a big church, a big name, but because of a lack of Christ-like character, die in shame. Political leaders, they win the election, but later their character reveals that they may not be one of God's elected. Let us not be so focused on the trophy that at the expense of getting the trophy, we have no testimony. All because we were so focused on the outcome by any means necessary. And rather than submitting and surrendering and allowing God to order our steps, we fall into deception. You see, but when God is ordering our steps in life, it's not about the opportunity in life to rebel. I want you to get this right here. Because like me, love opportunity. Can't wait for opportunity. Praying for opportunity. But we have to be careful when opportunity comes our way. You see, when God is ordering your steps in life, it's not only about the opportunity in life because the opportunity can deceive us and cause us to rebel against God. The opportunity can feed that ambition in us that will direct our steps where we fall into an ambush in life. You see, my brothers and sisters, in 1 Samuel 15 and 12, 22, it tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You see, if we only focus on the opportunity, to get what we want, we can be wrongly motivated to alter, to abuse, and to attack anyone and anything that gets in our way. <clears throat> now, why do I say that? You see, the devil gives you opportunity not to be faithful, but to forfeit your blessing. You see, it was the devil, the enemy, who gave the opportunity to Eve to take the bite from the tree. Yeah. The devil, the Satan, gave the opportunity to Jesus to turn his stone into bread when he was in wilderness. But Jesus didn't take the opportunity. Why? Because he was obedient to the will of the Father. The devil, Satan, proposed the opportunity for Jesus to become king before it's time for him to go to the cross. But Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father that he had to go to the cross. When Jesus was on the, on the cross, the people teased them and shamed them and tried to get them to come down to take the opportunity to forego the pain. But Jesus was obedient to the Father's will and he would not come down in our lives the enemy comes in to steal, kill and destroy he brings up opportunity for you to take the bait and go for the divorce he gives you the opportunity to cheat to steal, to lie to disobey he gives you the opportunity to make excuses for why you can't don't take the bait of the opportunity. Be faithful to the will of the Father and be obedient to God Almighty. God gives us obedience to accomplish His will in our lives and obedience unto God is the greatest success that you and I can ever achieve in life. No trophy can replace, no bank account can replace the reward that you and I will receive for being obedient to the will of God. Obedience is where God wants us. You see, if we are focused on obedience, it's not, not all about getting, but it's about becoming a follower, focused and fixed on accomplishing God's will. That's right. I know I'm bringing up some things when I say it's not all about the opportunity. You say, you sound like you're out of your mind, my brothers and sisters. You see, I want to give you two great examples of individuals 
that were successful, but they didn't have anything physically to show for it. Think about Mother Teresa, who was obedient to the will of the Father. What did she have at the end of her life to show for it? She had nothing but obedience to do God's will. She had no material wealth. What about Martin Luther King Jr.? He had nothing at the end. No big house. No big car. No big bank account. These two individuals were not driven by the opportunity to achieve the American dream. Their lives were driven by obedience to do the will of God Almighty. It was in Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech where he said in a prophetic voice, he said, I'm not afraid to die now. Like anybody, I would love to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But he said, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do what? God's will. Yes, Lord. It was God's will, he said, so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. Yeah. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Dr. King was not about the opportunity. He was about the obedience of the will of God, my brothers and sisters. Success is obedience to God. You see, the world associates success with what you have, with possessions. Big house, big car, big bank account, big office, clothes, vacation position. Is this truly success? <laughs> when you can have all of this and still be miserable? Yeah. Come on. Adam and Eve had everything. But why did they disobey? Why did they entertain their thoughts? They went after the wrong opportunity, my brothers and sisters. Yeah. They made a bad calculation. You see, they thought that more will make them more than. They were unwilling to accept that what God had given them was enough. Not only what he had given them was enough, but God was enough. But Jesus warns us and teaches us about success. He says, don't build what cannot last. Don't build your wealth where there is no work. We know the scriptures, Matthew 6 and 19. Do not throw for yourselves treasures on earth with moth and venom destroyed and with thieves break in and steal. Yeah. Paul teaches us in his text that true success is not based upon what you have, but true success is based upon who you have. Yes, sir. How do you measure true success? My question is how long does it last? Is it sustainable? Can it be doable? So here Paul, he's redefining for each of us the secret sauce to success. It's not what you have because that's temporary, but it's who you have that's permanent. It's not about your condition, that's temporary. It's about your commitment, which is permanent. It's not about where you are in life, that's your position, but it's about who are you for in life, that's your purpose. Paul says, I've learned the secret sauce. It's content. It has allowed me to endure with a joyful heart. This word content is all about that inner sense of rest and peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that he's in total control. You see, to be content, it does not mean that you do not desire more. No, it does not mean that you don't desire more. But it means that we depend more on what God has given you so that we can deny ourselves from being desperate and taking anything that the enemy tries to offer to us. Contentment does not mean that you do not desire more, but you depend more on whatever God has given you. Socrates had this quote right here. He said, he who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would have. Mm. He who is not contented with what he had would not be contented with what he would have had. 
my brothers and sisters, you may say, well, Pastor Green, can you please make this real simple? Well, I want to give you a great, simple picture that shows you true content. I want you to look here at my good friend, Beverly, Senator Bernie Sanders, on this picture right here in Life Church. You see Bernie with his mittens on? You see Bernie with his, his coat on? Bernie's not concerned with what everybody else is doing. Bernie's not caught up into what social media say about him. Bernie's at peace. It's cold outside, and I'm going to do what I need to do. My brothers and sisters, if we can't be content with God's little blessings, how can God trust us to be content with his large blessings? I got a story right here for you. There's a story of two drops floating down the river of life. One teardrop said to another, who are you? It says, I'm a teardrop from a girl who loved a man and lost him. The other said, well, who are you? She said, I am a teardrop from the girl who got him. You see, one person is crying because she lost him. The other person is crying because she got him. The secret to contentment is learn how to be satisfied with what you have. You see, we are not content. When we are not content, we spend more, we work more, we stretch more, we worry more, we have more anxiety, we uptight more, we argue more, we distant more, we doubt more. My brothers and sisters, come on, man. we can be content when we know who's totally in control. Yes, sir. So my question to you today is, What's the missing ingredients in your sauce for being content? Yeah. My brothers and sisters, do you have too much salt in your sauce? When you're always a salty person, always salty spreading gossip, always salty starting a negative conversation, always being that person trying to mess up everybody else. And back in the day, we said, quit. Throwing salt on my game. Yeah. Don't throw salt. Be the salt that's preserving the truth and not polluting the truth. Or do, my brothers and sisters, you may have too much salt. Do you have too much spice in your life, in your salt? Too much spice when you have a hot temper, having temper tantrums when life does not go your way. Your spicy hot in your soul. Sweating about everything and just looking like a mess. Or do you have too much sugar in your sauce? When you're too sweet, too salt, everything goes, not taking a stand for anything and falling for everything. Don't be like our current politicians. No moral background. No consciousness of righteousness. My brothers and sisters, learn how to rejoice in everything and be thankful for whatever God has given you. But not only must you rejoice, my second point here, my brother and sister is, you must learn how to release your resistance in life. If you're gonna be content, you must learn how to release your resentment. You see, some of us are bottled up with past hurts, past pains, past disappointments, frustrations, regrets, shames, we're just like, Pop when we put it in the freezer. We're about to explode and make a big mess. You see, resentment in life will reverse your life with an attitude that refuses to embrace the future, all because we're preoccupied with our past. But Paul here redacts, he redirects his resentment with the local church, with words to reconcile, but not to retaliate. You see, the church had been generous with Paul, but politely and constructively, Paul brings to their consciousness. What have you done for me lately? When he makes the positive comment that would have touched the Holy Ghost nerve in 4, 17 and 18, where he says, he says, not that I would desire a gift from you, but what I desire is that more be credit to your account. You see, I've received full payment and have more than enough. You see, Paul was rejoicing, not in the Lord. He was rejoicing 
And because he was rejoicing, he was not resisting what the church had not done or was not doing. He reached out with his energy and he released his resentment by being content. Say, I know you forgot about me, my brothers and sisters, but I'm here not to bring resentment, but I'm here to bring reconciliation. Do you have resentment in your heart? Where you're pushing people back? Where you're not working to come back together and bring reconciliation? See, Paul here is working to bring reconciliation to church. So this serves as a great example to the church that you and I must constantly be striving to grow in our godliness. You know the scripture? Godliness with contentment is great gain. And so what does it require you and I to do? It requires you and I to grow up. You see, babies cry when they don't get their way. Children act up when they don't get their way. But as adults, we have to learn how to release our resentment so that we can move forward in our life. First Corinthians 13, 11 tells us, when I was a child, I talked as a child, I thought as a child, I breathed as a child. But when I became a man, I put these childish behaviors behind me. You see, contentment requires that one become conscious of their unconsciousness of behaviors are not becoming of a child of God. When we are content in life, we have a consistent attitude because we're not controlled by our circumstances. We are growing from our circumstances. You see, the danger of resentment, my brothers and sisters, is resentment can become like pain in your brain. You might say, but why is that? Because it keeps you centered away from the possibilities that can come your way. Resentment can serve like glue or magnet that traps you in the past rather than positioning what God is doing and what God can do for your life. So this morning, get rid of the resentment because it's taking up too much space on your memory board in your mind. Get rid of resentment it's blocking too many blessings in your heart. Get rid of the resentment. It's a cloud that's covering your globe. Your resentment, my brothers and sisters, it has to go. And so when we rejoice in the Lord, it positions us to release that resentment. And when we are able to resent, release that resentment, helps us <clears throat> to be able to reset our reality. That's right. When we rejoice in the Lord, we're able to release that resentment to reset our reality from I can't to I can do all things. You see, when you focus on your rejoicing, it allows us to, re to release our resentment so that we can reset our reality. The reality from being a prisoner of our past, a bit of prisoner of our pain, a bit of prisoner of our failures, a prisoner of our pride, a prisoner of our arrogance, a prisoner of our shame, a prisoner of our regret. My brothers and sisters, this morning it's time to reset your reality. There is God before you. Who can be against me? It's time to reset your reality that I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. It's time to reset your reality that I'm the head and not the tail. It's time to reset your reality that I'm the light of the world and not the night of the world. It's time to reset your reality based upon where you are. Paul gives us the scripture in 4 and 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now this secret sauce of the apostle, the apostle is not the mild sauce we get from Hurls or Kenny's chicken. This secret sauce of Paul was not about what he did, 
But it's more about what the text says. I can do all things through. That's comprehensive. That's including every aspect of our life. But the question is, where can he do all things? The scripture says he can do all things through Christ Jesus. This is our hallelujah. This is our, our, our moment of freedom. You see, Paul did not see his life separate from Christ. But Paul saw his life dwelling in Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are past. Behold, all things are new. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and that which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith of the Son of God. So for Paul, when he thought about his difficulties, he was not overcome with word because he acknowledged that he was not alone, that he was with Christ, united with Christ, joined with Christ. Therefore, Paul says, I can be content because I'm with the one that has all power and all authority. I'm with the one who's the Alpha and the Omega. The one who's the beginning and the end. The one who is the light in my dark situation. The one who is my joy when I'm in pain. The one who's my peace during my storm. The one where there is no lack, my brothers and sisters. You see, Paul, he recognized that all that he needed was Jesus Christ. He was consumed. Why? Because he was rejoicing for what God had doing, what God is doing. And for Paul, it was all about being in Christ, serving Christ, growing in Christ. And he recognized, I can't control what other people do for me. That's beyond my pay grade. I can't control that. So why should I have resentment over what I can't control? Why should I be disappointed and frustrated over what I don't have control over? But I can't control that I look to the hills which come with my help, my help coming from the Lord. I can't control that I know that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. I can't control the fact that I believe that my God is sovereign. He's in total control. And if God started a good work, he's going to finish his good work in my life. Yeah. Paul knew and Paul believed that Jesus Christ was everything that he needed in his life. He looked at the life of Jesus when Jesus on the cross he did not come down. Why? Because Jesus believed, even though he was being punished and crucified, that the Father was still with him. Yeah. The three Hebrew boys, they were willing to bow down, not bow down, and be thrown into the fiery furnace. Why? Because they believed, no matter where they were, outside the fire or in the fire, that God would be with them. David was willing to fight Goliath. He was not intimidated by the giant. Why? Because he believed that his God was with him. Joshua and Caleb believed that they could defeat the Canaanites. Why? Because they said, if our God delights with us, we are well able to overcome them. Joseph, even though his brothers had did him wrong, he didn't hold grudges. He didn't hold a resentment. Joseph, he cried, but then he celebrated because he knew behind the scenes what the devil had meant for evil, God meant for good, and Joseph knew that all things were working together for him. Yes, God. Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, he knew that his God was there to preserve him. He would not bow down and eat from the king's table. Why? Because he believed that God was with him. Abraham was willing to give up his son because he believed that God would provide. Yes, God. For the thief on the cross, at the last minute, at the last second, 
no time to spare. All he needed to know that he was by the one that to pave the way and make a place for him in paradise that Jesus cannot be with you. Forgive me of my sins. My brothers and sisters, all we need is to know that God is on our side. That's all we need to know. We're able to rejoice. We're able to release ourselves from resentment. And then we're able to reset our reality. That if God is with me, he's more than the world that's against us. I pray you've been blessed and that you've been inspired. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.